and welcome to this SheClicks webinar. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of SheClicks. Well, before we get started, we have a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by MPB, the world's largest platform for used photography and videography kit. MPB has transformed the way people buy, sell and trade equipment, making photography more accessible, affordable and sustainable. MPB is proud to partner with SheClicks to help support women photographers and their work. So thank you very much to MPB. Right, let's get started. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Anna Neubauer, a photographer and visual artist with a love of storytelling. Hi, Anna, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining. My name is Anna and I'm a portrait photographer based in London. A lot of my work is centered on people with visible differences because I think the less diversity people see in their everyday lives, the more disconcerting they might find it. And I think that's something I can change. I've been full of freelance for about almost two years now. I think it's two years in May. And in the next hour, I'm going to be talking about my creative background, why I do what I do in terms of diversity and inclusion. And I'll show you some examples of my work, some personal, editorial, and commercial and commission projects. And then I prepared one image for Lightroom and one for Photoshop. And at the end, you can basically ask me anything you want. I think I've always had a creative drive. I loved all kinds of arts and crafts. I remember my parents definitely lost it several times because I covered the whole house in glitter or glue. <laughs> Um, but when I got my first real DSLR camera, it opened up a whole new world of being creative for me. And I was just blown away by the things you can do with it. I love that you can blur the background and everything just looked amazing. I remember taking pictures of like everything, mostly like bumblebees and flowers. And I went to high school in Austria um, and we had a little bit of Photoshop every once in a while, which I loved. So I started to combine my love for photography with Photoshop and did all kinds of like collages or um, strange compositions. And after high school, I went to the University of Arts in Austria and I studied time-based and interactive media, which is like mostly film and coding. And I know I shouldn't say that, but I didn't really enjoy it. So photography became my escape and I spent every free minute taking pictures of friends or um, lots of self-portraits. It was kind of like my safe space. It felt a bit like therapy. And I got into this Flickr group. We still call it the Flickr family. And some of these people you can see in the pictures, they're still some of my best friends. And we, I think I spent all my money and all my free time on traveling to see these people and just to hang out and learn from each other. And it was such an amazing time. Um, these are some of my very old pictures. I loved putting my friends in lakes or setting things on fire. That was just, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know why. Um, my kind of storytelling and it felt amazing to just spend hours and hours in Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, back then I worked for an advertising agency and photography was like my side hustle a side hustle that didn't pay. Um, and at some point I got a message from a quite well-known company in Austria and they wanted me to shoot their campaigns. And I was so honored and for the first time thought that I might actually be able to be a full-time photographer. And back then I loved fashion and my biggest dream was to work in campaigns like America's Next Top Model with a lot of budget, like a massive team. So that was a, a teeny tiny step towards my, my big dream. And everything seemed perfect at the shoot, at the first shoot. Um, 
until they pulled me aside and they were like, can you crop her face? She's really ugly. And I know that this is, it's not me, but, and I'm actually embarrassed that I followed their instructions, but I also didn't really know what to do because they were my client. Um, they paid me even though I didn't really need the money, but I also did it for my own pride and I'm really not proud of it now. Um, but when I got home, it really hit me and I was like, this is insane. Um, I felt so lost and I was so angry at myself and at the industry. And I started to think more about messages and just the industry in general. And then in 2019, I finally moved to London, um, something I really wanted to do for a long time. And I decided to put my focus on what I can do to contribute to more open, diverse and inclusive society and started to work with people who had the same mission. Um, and I also realized what kind of power you have as a photographer. And that's basically how it started. Um, I started to work in a project called The Beauty of Humanity. Um, and I just wanted my images to really tell the story of someone and move away from traditional stereotypes because lots of images of people with differences or disabilities are always focused on the difference. It's never about the human. And that's what I wanted to change. Um, I shoot with natural light only because I'm self-taught and I find it easier um, to tell a story without having a lot of lights around me. I'm going to explain a few um, light situations here. I'm going to start with the one on the right. That was a very overcast day in winter. Um, I love overcast because it just creates this really nice soft light. The one in the middle is direct sunlight, which I also love because you can just play with shadows and contrast. And I love Callum's eyes and the and the blue sky. Um, and the one on the left is the sunlight through a moon shape on my window. And I'm gonna explain what I did here because it might sound a bit strange. Um, I took a self portrait, I think that was in lockdown. I just got bored um, and the light came through the window and it made this really nice um, window shape on the wall and, and it was so sharp. I thought maybe I can use different shapes. And I had this idea of holding the moon, but the moon um, just being the light source. But then I realized I can't really hold light. So um, it ended up being a bit different, but I used Photoshop and the uh, transfer, transform tool to figure out the angle of the moon and cut the moon shape, which you can see in the middle. Um, covered the whole window. Um, I couldn't find enough cardboard, so I just used whatever I could find. And then I basically had to wait until six to have the moon on the wall. And that's the final picture. Um, I hope this makes sense. This is also my Instagram story highlights, <laughs> if anyone wants to see um, a step-by-step. -step. Um, Another thing I really love is just one light source from one side and it works really well inside to create this like nice and soft portrait light. The situation in the middle is moody and overcast and it sometimes seems strange to take pictures when it's dark, but I felt it really fit there their mood <laughs> and the one on the right was a bright and overcast day and I just put up a backdrop and had the model pose in front of it and the sunlight came through every once in a while and I think in this shot it actually um, just came through. Um, one thing I learned throughout the years is to let the light be part of the story. If you don't have the perfect 
setting or the perfect setup and it looked different in your head, just try to be creative and make the light part of the story. You can use trees with the and have shadows on people's faces or you can use the bright sunlight to make an image more pop or um, make it more moody. The second image uh, from the left is shot through a yellow lid of a marble container. Um, and I found that really cool because I wanted, I didn't really know what to do with the light in that situation because it was a London day, which means it was just cloudy and not the nice kind of cloudy. But then I found that yellow thing and I shot the pictures through it and it just changed the whole story, I think. Um, here are, are a few of my commissions. Um, the one on the left was for Wex uh, with also one light source from one side. And the two in the middle were for Abercrombie Kids and for that shoot, I really panicked because it was such a big client and I felt like I really needed artificial lights in case I just don't get that commercial vibe. But in the end, I really didn't need it and it was just natural light. And the one on the right is a commission for Adobe and it was also shot in my room, my bedroom. And it was not the most interesting picture. I mean, it still isn't, but I think I like it because I, in Lightroom, I just changed um, the whole color. I just made it really warm. And I think that's why it's a bit special to me. And when you don't have a lot of equipment and just natural light, um, I find it quite interesting to use things that reflect, so sequins or uh, mirrors or those kinds of things. I also have to say, um, and I don't think I would have said that a few years ago, um, but I always spent all my money on traveling and meeting my Flickr, fr Flickr friends, um, so I never had money for any of of those like really expensive lights. Um, I have one very dodgy daylight lamp and I never use it. But um, now I'm quite happy that I never had money for those things <laughs> um, because I think it made me more creative. Um, the one on the right, I just shot through a plastic folder and I had that image in my head for quite a while, quite a long time, but um, I didn't really know how to do it, but then in the end it worked out. So I'm really happy about that. You can basically use whatever you find at home. You don't really need a lot of equipment or um, expensive props or unless you want to. But um, lots of people always ask me what camera I use and <laughs> it's quite embarrassing, but my Canon 5D Mark II is about 11 years old. I got it from one of my Flickr friends. Um, well, I bought it off him and it still works. So I don't think I'm gonna need an upgrade anytime soon. Um, so yeah, that was a few of my recent projects. And now I prepared one image in Lightroom and one in Photoshop. So I usually go for warmer colors because that's just me. I'm not I'm more a yellow person and not a blue person. Um, and I love the retro feel of an image. Um, so what I usually do is set the temperature to more on the yellow side. It always depends though. Um, but for this one, I set it to about this actually. 
Um, I made it a little bit brighter, but not too much because the background is already quite bright. This is, um, I have to say, like when I shoot with kids, I don't really let them pose too much. Um, it's more like people always tell me they feel like a photo shoot with me is more like hanging out, a, uh, a friend hanging out with them. So that's really nice. Um, and then we just have conversations and do things, but it's um, not a lot of post shots. And this one I really like because um, you can really see the connection between the triplets. Um, one thing I do a lot is I decrease the contrast um, to make it a bit more vintagey, if that makes sense. For Lightroom, it's like I just play around. Sometimes I spend hours or um, a really long time just to figure out what I want. So it's never the same. But if you play around with these tools, um, you can get like so many different outcomes. And I think that's really cool. Um, I'm going to set the highlights to about 40. Shadows down. If you Take the, if you decrease the shadows and then increase blacks, it also makes it a bit more um, retro, I feel like. The whites, I would say, are about here. And blacks, like I said, just increase the blacks a little bit. Um, another thing I love, and I think that's something I <laughs> discovered recently, um, I play with texture and clarity a little bit. Uh, I never did before because I thought it was strange because it, if you zoom in, um, and I feel like lots of people know this, if you decrease the texture, you get this very like, plasticky feel. Um, but if you decrease texture and increase clarity, you can balance that out. But it also always depends on the on the picture. But I, I suggest just play around um, if you want. I also love the tone curves um, because you can just get rid of that really bright background. And my favorite tool is color grading. Um, I set the shadows usually to like yellow or green. It always depends or like in between, um, but definitely on the warm side. <laughs> and then you can just play around and see what, what feels best. Um, it's still a bit too dark. Okay, the shadow's a bit more, but I quite like it like this, um, a bit retro. I always add grain, but if there is anything in the actual image I want to change, like dry skin or things in the background I don't like, um, I would export it now and open it in Photoshop. And then when I'm done with the retouching, I would just add about um, a little bit of grain. If not, I can do it in Lightroom as well. And I would just set it to about 30 or 25. It always depends. 
Um, so yeah, that's basically all I did with this image. Um, maybe a bit warmer even. Um, if you have any questions about this, please let me know at the end. Um, now I'll go back to my presentation. So I put the images next to each other so you can see the difference. Um, and the next one is this one. This is my friend Danny. I met him um, a few years ago, I think. Um, and we've had some photo shoots and just hangouts. He's really fun. And I, I loved his pose because it wasn't, it really was in stage. He was just hanging out in his backyard and we had a, um, a shoot day with lots of models and had some portfolio shoots and everyone was just having a great time. And I think at one point he got a bit bored and he was just lounging in his garden and um, turned his head. And that's when I took the picture. I loved the look, but I hated the background. And that's something I don't really do a lot anymore. Um, I used to do a lot in Photoshop, like edit all kinds of things in the background or, or make skin really like smooth. But now I'm a bit more on the documentary side. Um, so I usually don't edit a lot, but for this one, I just had to because I don't like the background. So I'm gonna show you a really cool tool in Photoshop. So what I always do is I create a copy of the background just because I like having the original image and then like comparing it. Um, I didn't really edit anything here because his skin is so perfect. And he's always like, his eyebrows are amazing. <laughs> Favorite eyebrows. Um, so I'm gonna create another layer of this. And then there's a really cool tool. Um, it's called Select Subject. And I think that's quite new in Photoshop, I'm not sure. Um, it selects the subject. This can be anything. This can be like an animal or um, basically any object. I think you can also select the sky, but I never really changed the sky anyway. Um, what I always do is mask because um, if you have a look at this, you just have his, his body. And then in the mask, you can basically change whatever you want. If the Photoshop automatic selection isn't like perfect, but for this one, it's actually quite good. Um, and I really like this tool because you can make portraits stand out more, I guess. Um, I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm making the background a bit darker with the curves. Not too much because um, it might be crazy. And then in the original one, um, the one I already did, I actually spend a lot of time editing the back background because I didn't just want to have like black, but I'm gonna show you what I did with the brush. I just created a new layer and basically just made the background 
more like darker. Um, this is a very fast one now. Um, you can then add some texture or copy and paste um, things from the actual background to make it a bit more natural. Um, I can quickly show you how to do that. Um, here's the stamp to clone stamp tool it's called. You can just copy stuff from the background and then I always create a new layer just because I don't wanna touch the original one or I think it's just a bit easier. and put it on top of the black one and then maybe degrees the fill a little bit. But um, I think you get the idea of what I did there and what you can do, just play around a little bit and figure out what looks natural or what looks good to you. And then The next step would be, so because this is still the mask, I can delete or make it nice, um, like make the edges nice. You can see that they're a bit like dodgy at, at bits, um, especially here where the ear is. So you can, Select the brush, select black for erasing stuff. I'll show you what it does. It does this, but I actually want white because I think his hair, the hairline should be a bit different here and then another thing I usually do when I like the body or like the the subject I go to the layers and convert the mask to a smart object and then rasterize the layer so I can edit it again. So that basically just got rid of the mask. Um, I always love a little bit of motion in portraits, even though they're still. I um, hope that makes sense. And there's a tool I like, it's called Smudge Tool. I just go to bits and make the edges a bit more natural, a bit more blurry, I guess. Um, but again, this is something you can play around with. This tool is incredibly slow if you use it on a big image. But um, this one is quite small, so it's fine. But sometimes I lose my mind. <laughs> um, another thing I would do is use the patch tool to get rid of some of the wrinkles. The patch tool is quite cool because you can just select and drag to the area you like. And something I just recently found out is, um, so there's a Photoshop action I use every once in a while. Let me see if I can find it. Just remembered. Um, you can download it 
for free, I think. If you search for skin by sparkle stock, um, they have a thing called skin airbrushing and I actually don't use it on the skin. Um, I like to use it on clothes because you can get rid of like small wrinkles. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it here. Um, you can try it at home if you like. You can see it like a little bit, it just makes the, the fabric a bit softer. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Um, I think so. Um, and then for me, the Definitely last the stop. <laughs> A little bit, yeah. Um, the last step would be color correction. And I, um, for this one, I didn't do a lot. Actually, I think I changed the mid-tones a little bit. And again, yellow, <laughs> always. And the shadows. The right side looks um, a bit too dark still, but I would have to do that in the background. But I think you, um, you know what I mean. Um, and then I usually select the whole image and copy, um, copy and paste, like have this just because I really like seeing before and after. Um, and I think the contrast is quite big. Um, so yeah, this is before and this is after. And then I add a little bit of noise usually three, but it depends on the size of the image. Um, and I think that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Yeah, we do have some questions. First question, uh, this, you, they might have missed it, but do you ever use any fill-in flash? Any what? Sorry. Fill-in flash. No. I've never okay. used it. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever attempted wedding photography using only natural light throughout the day? Yes. Um, <laughs> but so I, I got into photography um, over 10 years ago. And back then I was just too shy to tell people um, well, when someone was like, oh, can you take my portrait? I need a business portrait or can you shoot my wedding? <laughs> I was just too shy to say no. Um, and I didn't have a great time. It's just not my my type of, of photography. I think it's, I love, obviously weddings are such an, such an amazing um, thing. And I don't want to be the person messing up someone's most important day. And now it's funny because someone just asked me today to shoot their wedding, but I, I can't do it. <laughs> Fair enough. It's not for everybody, it's for sure. I do know a wedding photographer who shoots with natural light only and the pictures are really nice. <laughs> Um, so another question for you is, do you ever use any reflectors or diffusers to bounce light back into your image or to diffuse it? I used to um, when I first started because I thought um, I needed reflectors, but and I still have them, but um, I haven't used them in a very long time and I don't plan on using them anytime soon. Okay. In the image that you shot where you were shooting the, 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 the moon shape, that whole room was painted white, wasn't it? So that would bounce quite a lot of lights around. So it's, um, yeah, it was, um, so it was before we renovated the house 
So the walls had lots of cracks and it was, wasn't a nice room. Um, and the color was this very strange beigey or beigey white, I don't know, um, not a nice color, uh, but it definitely did something mm -hmm. to the image. <laughs> okay. Um, do your commercial clients know you only shoot in natural light uh, when they engage you? And how do they react to that? Or do they come to you because purely because of your images and they discover that you only use natural light? I'm not sure if they know. Um, and it's funny because last year I actually lost a job because they, well, I think I lost it because of my experience with artificial light. Even though if you if you have a big job, you can always get people um, like assistants or lighting operators. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if people know. Um, and now I'm I'm happy to explain. And I'm I am happy to use artificial light as long as it feels okay. But if I feel like it's a massive set and I need to know everything about every single lamp. I can't do it. That's fair enough. Okay. <laughs> um, this is an interesting question. Is it still your dream to do big name fashion campaigns or has the really positive direction that you've gone in and after such an awful experience that you had early on changed your ambitions? It definitely changed a lot. Um, I used to be obsessed with America's Next Top Model and Germany's Next Top Model. And now if I see Heidi Klum, like I, I can't deal um, with any of it because it's just, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really a fan of the industry. And still, even though we're moving towards a more inclusive uh, society, um, lots of brands just tick a box and that really annoys me. If there's um, if there's a brand who actually wants to change things, there are a few um, that are doing a great job like Primark, even though I'm not a fan of their production, but their campaigns are actually really good. Um, H&M or Zara or Mango, they never think about any, any of that. So it's still mostly skinny white people, um, which is great for some shots, but there's just no diversity. And then there's, um, yeah, they just take a box. So there's always one person in a wheelchair. There's always a person with Down syndrome and then maybe someone with a limb difference. But there's so many other conditions or just body shapes or whatever. And that just... Um, it's just a bit a bit frustrating, I would say. Yeah. So I'm not really into fashion photography unless I have the feeling that the brand is very honest um, about their mission. Abercrombie is actually really good as well. Do you get involved with the recruitment of the models for those shoots? Um sometimes for the Abercrombie one, it was, let me think. I suggested some people, but they definitely had an idea of what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, when I work with Adobe um, or the project, project that I've done with Adobe, um, it was just my casting and they're just a really cool client because they're happy. <laughs> That's nice. And when you are yeah. looking for more diverse models, how do you find them? So um, there's an agency called Zebedee. I'm sure some people know about it and they have lots of models with differences and disabilities and their mission is really cool. And um, they're quite famous now, but in lockdown, um, I got a commission for Adobe that was at the beginning of 2021 
And it was really funny because I was in Plymouth with my boyfriend's family and we were basically in lockdown. Um, and I panicked because I couldn't really find people, but then there's always Facebook. <laughs> um, and that sounds a bit like I'm a creep, but I just joined lots of groups like um, Disability Plymouth or um, Cornwall Down Syndrome or um, those communities are amazing because um, I met so many nice people through them and it was actually easier than I thought and then also Instagram um, I always try to explain the project and it's easier to work with an agency but sometimes you just meet really nice people um, on social media. <laughs> yeah, and then you want to work with them. And do you direct your models <laughs> much while you're actually taking your photographs? Or do you just react to what you find in front of you? Both, I would say. Um, I'm not the best director <laughs> um, because I, I feel like I don't want to boss people around. And... I always try to connect with everyone. So we usually just talk and find out what we have in common or what we did on the weekend or hobbies or whatever. And then it just kind of happens naturally. Um, I don't tell them what poses to do a lot every once in a while. I think it always depends on what I've got in my head, but um I like when people are just natural okay. uh, could you repeat the name of the model agency uh for people with disabilities please Zebedee Zebedee right okay thank you um and we've got a few questions about your um processing firstly someone's saying it's very brave to do a live demo of your Lightroom and Photoshop techniques because it's it's quite a <laughs> high pressure situation you mentioned something new stuff that you learned recently where did you pick those things up from and have you done any formal training or just have you just developed your own methods so i had um i learned the basics of photoshop in high school uh, in a media class and i just i don't know like photoshop and like especially photoshop is like therapy to me it's you can just do so many things and sometimes I click on something and actually I could I could show you another thing um if you quickly let me share my screen if that's okay go for it because that's something I, I just um discovered okay so I never I I don't do I don't watch any tutorials because I don't have the patience to sit through them. Um, so whatever I know in Photoshop and Lightroom is just because I click on things and I always listen to music so it doesn't really feel like work. But I'm um, going to copy this layer. And I recently went to noise and I don't, I have no idea what this is. Maybe someone does. It's called Median. Um, and it makes this very strange pattern. Um, I'm gonna leave it like this. And then if you go to the blending mode, I love blending modes um and set it to screen you get this really strange glow um so you could set it to i don't know quite quite a lot and then make the whole image a bit darker um i think it does make a bit of a difference mm. um it does it doesn't really work with this image but um that to answer the question, I just click on things and I um, play around. <laughs> See what you can work. And this is when I need a glow, this is what I what I usually do. Maybe I should look up 
uh, median. It's a noise reduction filter that works by reducing mm. the noise across um, a selection of pixels. So it kind that of divides sense. your image up into areas. And that's why, you know, that's why it sort of changed when you move the slider, because it makes the area yeah. that it's averaging across bigger, I suppose. But cool. Yeah. <laughs> One question that someone said, you started out in Lightroom and then you export to Photoshop and they were just wondering why you do that. Because in Lightroom, I mean, you can use the masking and all that um, in Lightroom, but it's just, I don't know, it doesn't really work for me. I like this, just a, I just like Photoshop. <laughs> I love Lightroom for color correction. You've got the ability to use layers in Photoshop. Yeah, and if I, especially with the patch tool and the, the clone stamp or um, those kinds of things, it's much easier to remove like dry skin or um, wrinkles. And I do love Lightroom as well, but uh, more for color correction. Yeah, okay. Um, someone was observing that some of what you do could seem counterintuitive to some photographers because you're adding blur and noise. And um, maybe you just like to explain your thinking about, you know, what, what you're doing there. Um, I'm, I'm never sure what I want my final image to look like. Um, and it always really depends on, on my mood. Mm -hmm. And I know um, I never add like a crazy amount of, of noise um or blur but sometimes I don't know I can't really explain it I just I just do whatever feels right for me yeah well, the, the first image you were working on you you made it warmer and you said you you, mm -hmm. you sort of commented on the retro look quite a lot yeah you know, quite a lot. And I think perhaps you know that that adding a little bit of grain or or noise and also a little blur here and there that perhaps contributes to that feel yeah I think so I think um I also didn't study photography because I was really like worried that people would tell me how to take my pictures so um I just always went with whatever felt right that makes sense <laughs> yeah no that absolutely is the right thing to do they're your images um who are your photographer inspirations? Um, I love documentary photography, and I think my favorite is a German photographer called uh, Daniel Etta. He does a lot of uh, climate crisis um, and refu refugee stuff. Um, and let me think. Uh, some of my old Flickr friends are quite well known in the industry now. Um, one of my best friends is Alex Stoddard, but his work is very different from mine. It's also not documentary, but his work is really like dreamy. He does self-portraits. If anyone wants to look him up, uh, he's really good. Okay. Thank you. Um... What is your go-to lens or what are your go-to lenses if you use several? <laughs> um, I have, um, I still don't have the, um, well, I don't really know how to explain it, but like I said, I never had um, enough money to spend on equipment or lenses and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, I got, a 28 to 70 Tamron on that old Canon. And I think that's my go-to because it's wide enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, usually shoot at 28. Um, and I tried lots of other lenses um, through some commissions or projects. And I would always go back to my old Tamron. Yeah. Very you can visualize it, I guess. <laughs> I think it doesn't that. really matter what you shoot with. Um, for me, it's more about the story and like the emotions. Yeah. 
And when you're focusing, do you use auto focus or do you focus manually? Mostly auto focus because it's easier. <laughs> but um, I also have a very cheap 50 um, millimeter lens and the autofocus doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, a question about your business. How do you find your clients? Um, I was very lucky with the Adobe connections, um, to be honest, but, uh, that started ages ago because they had a program called creative residency and I applied and I got very far, but in the end didn't get it. Um, and back then I was like, oh, Adobe, <laughs> um, but then I applied again and I didn't get it either. <laughs> um, and again, I was like, oh, Adobe. But then um, at one point they emailed me and they were like, oh, we, we'd love to work with you. And that just, um, I don't know, I think that was the start. And then um, I also pitch a lot, not at the moment, but I, uh, for, the, for the Abercrombie campaign, for example, <laughs> that was crazy because that's something I never thought would happen. Um, I I love LinkedIn and because you can like figure out uh, creative directors or teams and all that. Um, and I did a little bit of research and I found the creative director for Abercrombie Kids. And the reason I did it was because I used to hate the company. Um, when I tried on stuff in their in their stores, I was always an extra large, even though I was <laughs> not an extra large. Um, but that was when I was in high school. Um, and they, and at one point I saw a change in their campaigns. It was a lot more inclusive. So I went on LinkedIn and found the creative director and I just emailed her and I was on, I was like, I know this is a really long shot, um, because you're on the other side of the world, but I love what you do. Um, and if you... If you're ever looking for photographers, um, I'd love to be considered. And I didn't get an answer for about eight months. And then one random day, I got an email and the creative director was like, oh my God, I just found your email in my spam um, because I was looking for something different and um, let's do it. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it's wow. happening. So never, my... Um, I don't know. Um, I would say never think you're not good enough or just send that email. Um, send a hundred emails if you want to. Um, make yourself known. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? I mean, yeah. <laughs> nothing to lose. That's fantastic. Um, I've got another question about your processing. How do you know when you're working on an image? What, you know, how do you decide, right, that's enough now that I've, I've completed what I want to do? That's a very hard question because I used to spend hours in Photoshop and then sometimes, I mean, even now, um, when I play around and I go to the original one, I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? And then I just go back to uh, like tiny, tiny changes. Um, I think that's all a matter of finding your own style. Mm -hmm. And for me, it took a very long time to find my own style because I always felt like my style is not good enough or um, it needs to be. I mean, there's, for example, one of my old Flickr friends, all her pictures are blue. And back then people would look at a blue image and they would say, oh, that's her. So, oh. And I never had that. Um, so it always really depends on the mood, I think. But now I would leave it more natural. So was it playing around in Photoshop that helped you find your own style? Yeah, definitely. Um, and also figuring out what I want. Um, I love the, I do like portraiture, but also more documentary and documentary is more natural. So I would just, 
stay on the natural side um even though i know that some of my pictures are not that natural <laughs> okay now as i say th these last two um things are, are comments but i think you might like to hear them so the first one is having good artificial lighting and the skills to manipulate it can achieve amazing images but it's so refreshing to see what can be achieved with natural light not tied to equipment you've inspired me to challenge myself to take better photos in natural light anna so thank you so much it's very good nice. to hear <laughs> that's lovely isn't it and another comment is i love the confidence you have in your ideas and the way you make your photography it's pretty nerve-wracking doing presentations like this but you really back up your ideas um, about the techniques and resources you use and i think that's amazing i used to teach young people with additional needs and i wish i'd been into photography then because i would have loved to have been a part of this so Thank there you, you go very much. <laughs> nice to know isn't it and i think yeah. I th you know the sort of photography you're doing really does make a difference i think exactly what you said you know the, the more you see people um who are, have differences the more normal it seems to us so i think that's that's fantastic so thank you for that thank you so thank you very much for your presentation that's all of the questions um it's been lovely hearing from you, you. and seeing your images and learning your techniques thanks so much for having me Okay, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.